time for Talk Word, Cringeworthy Tales. And now, your host, Weekly Humorous Editor-in-Chief, Marty Dundix. Hi, and welcome to Talk Word. I'm Marty Dundix, Editor-in-Chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine, and this is Talk Word, a fun little podcast where professionally funny people come to tell awkward and cringeworthy stories. Today, I'm very excited to have... Um, a really a, a multi-talented uh, artist, uh, he's a cartoonist, he's a comedian, he's an actor, he's, he's many, many things. We're going to talk all about it today. Jason Chatfield is here. Hi, Jason. Hi, Marty. How you doing? I'm good. Welcome to TalkWord. Thank you for joining uh, me today. Yeah, sure. It's good to be... The first time we did this was in the little office. Yeah. Uh, right in, in, the little in, office. The, in the... Yeah, the... the now it's... This is, this is the new normal, I think. This is the future. Welcome so, to the future. Yeah. No more sitting in a tiny room together, uh, <laughs> in, in, intimately drawing doodles. You have to do a doodle on a tablet to share with me to to do any sort of activity. Um, right. We're all in a we're all in a little pods. Podcasts are now because each individual person is in zip zip lup, zip zip locked into a pod. Um, right. For eternity. Um, her, her, we are hermetically sealed off from the world. Yes. Ah, but that's fine. I mean, people didn't like really being around me anyway, and uh, now, <laughs> now you don't have to be. It's fine. We can just we can just CGI you in, uh, right? And that's fine. You can you can put me in in post. Exactly. We'll add you back in. Um, you do a lot of different things. You are a syndicated cartoonist for the Ginger Megs um, worldwide syndicated comic strip. Uh, that is mm-hmm. a daily and Sunday uh, uh, comic that's been around for a very long time. You do Mad Magazine, New Yorker, Airmail Weekly. You've done Weekly Humorist. Um, also, you've done television stuff. You're a stand-up comic. I mean, you're very busy. You do a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I figure I just have to cover as many bases as possible for when the entire world just tanks. I mean, you know, you just have, have, have as many skills as possible. You do. I mean, you're kind of like a Swiss Army knife when it comes to creative uh, people, and your schedule is always interesting because I follow you on Instagram, and you're very funny on Instagram, and you always have um, Scotch Bath Sundays. Are if you know <laughs> yes. Jason Chaffield and you follow Jason Chaffield anywhere, you know that on Sundays he takes a bath yes. and he has a scotch and he does all of his drawings. Do you do the drawings for the entire well, I, week? I, I do the writing for it. I don't draw it. I write all the writing of the strip because it's, if you do it in one sitting, it's a bit more consistent. Um, it's like, you know, I, I think it's good creatively to have rituals because it saves you from having to mentally exercise, you know, very purposefully go, all right, now I'm going to be creative. If I know that every Sunday I'm going to have a scotch bath, I'll go, well, I'll defer that to Sunday. You know, um, I didn't, I, you know, yeah. I think I didn't realize that you wrote and illustrated the ginger mix. Of course, yeah, it's a one-man show. I you write do it, that it, all by yourself. It, invoice. Yeah. Wow, how it's a lot of work! <laughs> so, for the storylines for for a comic strip like that, mm. because I grew up, uh, I was a big comics, newspaper comics fan, big Sunday mm. comics fan. But I I read them every day. I would cut them right. out. I would put them in like photo uh, albums. <laughs> That's awesome. Like I was such a little weirdo. I I had like no, all of so my. Weird. I cut out all of the Calvin and Hobbes. I cut out Garfield. Nice. I cut mm-hmm. out uh, different ones that were always sort of funnier than other times. Like sometimes some of the, um, was it Non Sequitur? Was that one of them? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That That's was very Wiley fun. Miller. Yep. Yes, Wiley. Mm-hmm. He's still uh, around. Is he? Do you know all these mm-hmm. people? Yeah, they're all friends of mine. I mean, it's weird that you say that. Well, with the exception of Watterson, obviously. Um, it's very strange now because these people were all heroes of mine and I did the same thing. I used to clip them out and put them on my wardrobe. I'd take them onto, it's something I've always kind of done. Uh, as you can probably see, yeah. this is my studio wall. I always stuff that uh, inspires me or that I really admire, like work, like Bill Waters and Calvin and I was an incredible comic strip. I, I would say probably the best comic strip. Um, and uh, the, I, I, I guess seeing it, you you subconsciously absorb different bits and pieces of it. I was talking to a, a bunch of cartoonists yesterday, uh, New Yorker cartoonists, and, and about um, graphic novels and about the word balloons and the captions and how much space breathing room needs to be around the words to let them read nicely and reduce well. And we used the Watterson 
ratio, which is Bill Watterson's consistent ratio of how much um, the letting and the kerning, uh, the the space between lines and letters, um, and then the space between the letters and the bubbles, all that stuff. If you flick through your album that you had as a kid and you see it all, you sort of absorb these unofficial rules of comics mm-hmm. and you just sort of like like the Scott McCloud Bible, you know, understanding comics. You, you just have this sort of um, innate sort of knowledge of it just through by virtue of just exposing yourself to it. And I do that with all art. I like doing that with music, with um, comedy. You know, I, I've probably seen more comedy live in person than, uh, than I probably should have. Uh, <laughs> but I feel like I absorbed a lot of bits of business through just watching it live, not watching specials that are produced and taped and edited, like actual live comedy on stage, you know, hosting shows, doing shows, watching shows, just, yeah, I think it's the best way to learn anything. Just see as much of it, absorb as much of it as you can. Uh, watching live stand-up comedy in New York is a ton of fun, and you've been on the Guaranteed Delivery Show, and I've, yes. I, you know, I go to tons and tons of stand-up uh, to look for people to book on my show, but also just I enjoy stand-up mm. comedy so much live in New York City. Also, I agree with you because it's fun seeing a special on Netflix, and it's great. You know, you're seeing the best jokes, and you're seeing the you know the perfect yeah. delivery, and you're seeing everything great. But it's so fun to go to a live stand-up comedy show because it's so unexpected and you know totally. things things can go south so quickly and but but when yeah. they when they hit well uh, seeing it live is so gratifying and the audience reaction yeah. is so incredible in the moment when all these mm-hmm. people together are laughing at this one you know it could just be a raised eyebrow like anything can make when you really have that yeah. crowd and you're you have them it's like a magic know? trick yeah it's like a magic trick like you have them in the palm of your hand they love you right Anything you yeah. do is going to get this crazy, just this roar. <laughs> and being yeah. around that is so exciting. It's so, totally. it's this magical Well, because uh, there's nowhere to hide. Yeah. There's no editing. There's no sweetening the laughs. There's no adding in the laughs after the fact yeah. in the edit. Like, it's all live. There's nowhere to hide. You're funny or you're not. And a room full of strangers who don't know each other have somehow come to a consensus that that was really funny. And, and the, then that contagious sort of laughter is just yeah. like, there's nothing like it in the world. It's very psychological laughter, and people yeah. people enjoy themselves and laugh. Uh, it's almost like the way that when you see a movie, you enjoy the movie more when you're with a bunch of people in a theater, yeah. and you enjoy and totally. you laugh more at something when you're with a crowd of people it's like this collective Mm. agreement that everyone's like this is amazing and you don't really have that this is amazing feeling when you're watching something all by yourself in a room with headphones on you're not having that that outward audible appreciation you might be laughing on the inside netflix yeah the other thing is like netflix specials particularly any streaming specials now um, they kind of front load them. So instead of at a, at a show where you might have your, you know, some pretty, a pretty strong opener and then it's sort of this W shape, um, set mm-hmm. where, you know, you, you have this dip so that you can have this nice big peak in the middle and then a, a little dip for the penultimate and then bang, finish with your biggest, funniest joke. A lot of them are kind of moving their set around so that the funniest stuff is in the first 10 minutes so that you keep watching. Like just to keep your ADD attention. Yeah, we <laughs> and, only pay attention for five ten minutes anyway. We're like, oh, great, yeah. skip ahead. But if you paid a ticket price and you bought, you know, you know, there's a two drink minimum, and you're in for the show for ninety minutes, you're going to pay attention. You're going to watch, yeah. and you, you, the comedian has the luxury of not having to put all their best jokes up top so that you know they get your attention. Um, they can they can sort of space them out and pace it nicely and explore ideas, take you on a bit of a journey. Um, that's what I love about live comedy as opposed to, I don't watch a lot of specials anymore. Yeah. Well, if you do, I mean, there's a certain comics are much better at maybe, I mean, it's the, it's the type of joke t- uh, writing where mm. you have someone who isn't doing set up punchline, set up punchline. They're doing right. more a almost basically storytelling with jokes. Like a John Mulaney yeah. special is very different than like, Totally. Uh, a Kevin James special, which I actually watched back to back on Netflix because yeah. I was watching John Mulaney, and then the next like thing that fast. came up was like, "You want to watch this?" And I was like, "I guess." And I was like, "So I watched." It. I was like, "God, that was so <laughs> so bad compared to seeing." It's the a John bad Mulaney. recommendation after Mulaney. Yeah. I mean, 
Jeez. Yeah. What do you I hear mean, from that? People like, I mean, King of Queens, he's a nice guy. I think he's, yeah. he's blue collar. I, no, I like him. He's relatable, but uh, it was just so Successful different. comic. I'm not bashing him. Yeah. I'm just saying, no. after Mulaney, that's, it's that's a tough palate cleanser. It was actually hard. And I was I started watching a little bit of the new Seinfeld. I haven't watched all of it. But mm. I got, you know, that, that Mulaney special from... I think it was from Radio City. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Yeah. I think it was from Radio. It might have been Carnegie Hall or Radio City. One of the two. Yeah, it was one of the two. But the, even just yeah. the intro of it, when he was going yeah. backstage and running around and stuff, that was so good. And the whole special yeah. was so good. And then I, I feel like you watch other people's specials, and it's like it's unfair. Like his was so mm-hmm. good, it's unfair compared to the other people who were also very funny. Oh, no but it's just it wasn't. Like production wise, it's not even as good. Like it, it was like so, yeah. so many things about it were so perfectly done. Um, I wanted to He's talk. A craftsman. Yeah, you guys did something. Cartoonists around the world did something this past Sunday um, that did. was in appreciation to frontline workers and healthcare workers. So tell me a little bit yes. about what all the different cartoonists did in comic strips, in uh, newspapers, and online around mm-hmm. the world. What was that about? Well, uh, there's a cartoonist named Rick Kirkman who does a comic strip called Baby Blues. Oh, Baby Blues. And, yeah, it's good. Yeah. And uh, he kind of – he was talking to some other cartoonists, um, and uh, it was one of those very strange sort of organic conversations that, you know, a lot of cartoonists, we all know each other, we all talk to each other. And we when we get onto a conversation about something, um, you know, really important – it, it kind of rattles around and uh, uh, it's one of those things. Uh, Kirkman had this idea. He's like, I really want to do something to celebrate the frontline workers because, you know, here in New York at seven o'clock, everyone's clapping and cheering and screaming and banging pots and pans to thank frontline workers. Um, he's like, but what if there was like a bigger version of that, you know, um, goosebumps you know feeling yeah. <laughs> um of, of of telling everyone you know how how much we really really appreciate this so um he was talking to jeff keen who does family circus uh hillary price who does rhymes with all uh orange dave coverley bill hines jerry scott stefan pastas who does pills before swine um they all kind of got together got their heads together and then he brought it to me and said what if all of the cartoonists, uh, comic strip artists, panel, animators, web comics, you know, illustrators, magazine cartoonists, anyone who has a platform anywhere. It doesn't have to be in print. Um, the cartoon that they released on Sunday, June 7th, and this is back in March, so the deadline was sneaking up because mm-hmm. uh, we work about eight weeks ahead. Um, he said, what, what if that becomes like a way that we can uh if we all do the same thing on the same day we can all uh thank frontline workers by hiding six key icons in uh work and i was like well that sounds like a fantastic idea that's that's great um and i was like but how, okay so now we have to figure out how to get everyone on board so uh i am the current president of the national cartoon society which is an organization um, it's been around since 1946. It's all different kinds of cartoonists. And um, I immediately, as soon as I got off the phone to Rick, I was like, all right, we have to move quickly on this. Mm-hmm. And I sent out a message to all the cartoonists, went through all our social, emailed a whole bunch of key people who should be involved. Um, and then sort of uh, we started to get the syndicates involved because many of the deadlines had already been met for that Sunday. So we had to work with the syndicates who were the, you know, they're the people who sort of, um, take all the cartoons and put them in all the different newspapers and magazines. So we had to make sure that they were on board to replace those strips and panels and cartoons for that, for that day. And um, it was, it was quite a lot of work. It was a lot, a lot more work than initially I think I thought it might be. Um, But the, the six things we wanted to hide were um, uh, a a mask, uh, which is for um, frontline workers, um, you know, medical staff, um, doctors, nurses, uh, first responders, a steering wheel, which was for truck drivers, buses, taxis, people getting um, things to us that (laughs) that need to get to us, Um, a shopping cart, which was grocery workers and restaurant workers um, and uh, and farmers as well, Um, an apple, uh, which was teachers, teachers having to teach over Zoom, 
um, and a fork, which again is the restaurants that have stayed open and also the restaurants that have been feeding frontline workers and uh, and homeless people, uh, and a microscope for the researchers, the people trying to come up with a vaccine, a cure, trying to figure out how the heck this virus works. So we had everyone hide those little things or in, sort of integrate them into their comic, um, into their cartoon uh, in a clever, creative way. So it was almost like a, a like a puzzle search, like find these, you know, mm-hmm. things in a puzzle. Um, but it was really interesting because everyone did something different. Um, it was really fun to go through and you still can go through. If you go to like gocomics.com or comicskingdom.com, you can see all the different cartoonists on June 7th have all these cartoons and see which ones have the, the icons in them. And the readers loved it. They appreciated the fact that it was a big coordinated thing that we'd never done before. Um, and it was for a good cause. And it was during a week which, as you can imagine, news-wise, yeah, um, busy, pretty, uh, pretty busy. So we were we were worried it might get steamrolled uh, by all of that news, of course, and you know, rightly so. <laughs> it's way more important. Yeah, um, uh, it was way more important at the time. But um, we actually really wanted to make sure that you know everyone knew what we were doing, and so we we did get a lot of coverage and a lot of. A lot of people did see it. And I looked. It. I I looked at many different cartoonists because a lot of people yeah. posted like stuff that is in syndication. Also ends up on Instagram. Yeah. Also ends up on Facebook. So I did get to mm-hmm. go through a bunch of different cartoonists' cartoons, and it was fun mm. seeing how. I mean, some were way too easy. I was like, "Come on, <laughs> yeah. I could find this in two seconds." Yeah. And then other people it was yeah. really hard. I was like, "Where is the fork?" I can't find the fork, <laughs> but then I found it. Yeah. Uh, but t- tons of different uh, illustrators, cartoonists, different mm-hmm. types uh, of, of art did do mm-hmm. it all over the place. It was really cool to see. Yeah. Were there any um, any specific cartoons where uh, they were like, uh, uh, we got to get this, we got to swap out the art for that baby blues because that art's already in. We got to swap it out with this drawing. Get a, you know, get it in yeah. the print. And you're like calling someone frantically before it goes to press at the. There was uh, definitely that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's and that's why we were so lucky that we actually got the syndicates on board because not only did they have access to the media um, to kind of promote it in a big way, but they also had access to every single one of their creators yeah. who are political cartoonists and comic strip and panel and magazine illustrators and stop writers. the presses, stop the presses, pull that Doonesbury. Yeah. We got to swap it for other art. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doonesbury did one. Yep. There was a lot. Um, it's funny because I think um, the if I mentioned Wiley Miller uh, had a comic that was like set in prehistoric times. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> the shopping cart isn't that. How are we going to figure out that in? And Cave paintings? How are we going to? Maybe. I don't yeah. Know. So he figured it out, though. He, he did it in a very creative way. Um, you should definitely cool. go check it out. It's, 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 uh, he's a very, he's very cleverly done that. Is there a place where one person can go to look at all the different cartoons that participated? Yes. Uh, yeah. If if you go to comicskingdom.com, there okay. should be a site with all of them there. Oh, cool. Uh, I'll put that there. as a link when we put this out. Yeah. And uh, that's very exciting. I love – so uh, the National Cartoonist Society is mm. a uh, long time – it was, what, founded in the 40s? Um, 1946, yeah. By and I looked this up, Rube Goldberg, which w- was one yeah. of the founders of the Funny Machines. Yeah. Of the Funny Machines, the, fa- the founding document was signed by a pen that was hooked up to a pulley, and then there was a <laughs> wheel, and then there was yeah, yeah uh, Rube Goldberg, and that's that's why our big award is called the Rubin Award. It's named after Rube Goldberg. It's like our Oscar. That is so cool. And the Rubin Award last year went to I think. Was it Seth Peter Cooper? Pastis. Oh, did Peter Cooper win the year before? Didn't didn't he? He win won a... for he won last year for graphic novel. Okay. I think he had a great uh, Kafka esque was his great graphic That's novel right. that he Kafka esque. And then he just did Heart of Darkness. I yes. think I went to an opening. I love for his that. work. He's amazing. He's so good and he's so generous yeah. with his work. Like he sends uh, weekly humorous stuff. If he has, he 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 is excited about doing his art. He, so he does it, yeah. and then he just kind of sends it out if if someone else wants to, you know, he's like, if he doesn't yeah. do it just just to get published in the New Yorker, you know, he does it, and right, right. it might go to the New Yorker, but if it's not, he's like, 
Marty, how about this? Marty, how about this? And I'm like, God, you know, this is so. It's like a, a yeah, you know, a, 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 what's it called? A something of riches, of uh, of uh, uh, embarrassment, uh, an embarrassment an of emba- riches, an embarrassment of riches. I have these talented yeah. people just like offering stuff for weekly here. It's like, please, and I'm like, <laughs> yes, send me all the stuff you can. And um, <laughs> you know, Bob, I get Bob Eckstein sending me stuff like that, and and Ivan, and yeah. I think I is I, is Ivan in the society? He's in the society. I, Ivan, I think, is in Ivan the society. Ellis? Yeah, this, I yeah. love it when... It's people... always strange when you say the society. It sounds like a secret society. It is. <laughs> what is your... It's, do uh, Do you guys do a lot of stuff, crossover stuff, with the Society of Illustrators? We do, yeah. In fact, we have a big uh, annual Christmas event at the Society of Illustrators. We have a, a lot of our uh, Manhattan chapter events and LA chapter events at the Society of Illustrators in LA and New York. Um, all the jurying for our, um, I think, graphic novel, comic book, and illustration juries, they're done at the Society of Illustrators uh, with special uh, specialist juries. Um, yeah, there's a lot of crossover there. We, we have a lot of sort of affiliations with um, the... Uh, you know, professional cartoonist organization in the UK, the Lakes International Comic Arts Festival. Um, we have uh, the Australian Cartoonist Association, the Cartoonist Club of Great Britain. Um, uh, uh, so there's actually a lot of organizations within America too that we're starting to... Um, it's, it's, it's interesting that we're all sort of in this same position where we are having to evolve um, because, you know, the traditional way of making a living as a cartoonist used to be to be published in magazines and newspapers right. and print. Um, and now, you know, the, the, the terrain has changed and so should the organization. So we, along with um, organizations like ISCA, uh, the International Society of Character Artists, the uh, American Association of Editorial Cartoonists, um, there's one for everything. Um, <laughs> uh, we all kind of, um, uh, you know, we're all talking to each other to figure out, hey, what are you doing? What yeah. are you doing? What isn't working? What is working? How can we basically offer, offer the best um, support for our members and, and give them what, what What are you looking for in an organization? What can we do to help? So, yeah, that's what we, that's what we do a lot of right now. Something that's been very fun to be, I guess I'm more of a watcher. I haven't really been participating because I'm lazy, but Tom Richmond has been doing yeah. a caricature of the day for the coronavirus. It was like a corona caricature, I think is what he calls it. Yeah, corona caricature. Yeah. Corona caricature. And um, that's been so much fun to watch people mm. do. Like he'll pick a famous person to do the picture of in the morning or so. He'll, he'll put up like four photos and then all the artists go and spend the day doing a fun illustration and then they post them and then he posts his every day. And it's amazing because he's so talented. He's, you know, so, you know, this, this, this level of mad magazine caricature that was kind of the standard Mm -hmm. that was like a more Drucker esque type um, for me growing up. And he just kind of like the way to see how he does it every day. He's just like, it's just like breathing for him. It's just like, Oh, here's a perfect. Well, it's amazing. He is one of these great cartoonist who is in love with process right mm-hmm. he he's not he never does it for any accolades or anything he does it because he's in love with the process of it and one of the great things about tom is he's a great teacher and so tom uh, he does workshops he does um in-person workshops and now virtual workshops for caricaturing um but his ability to show you by doing mm-hmm. um is really interesting because he used to train theme park caricaturists um Uh, a lot of theme park caricaturists. And so they all sort of had this sort of process, this style that they could rely upon um, to get a pretty reliable sort of, you know, likeness and a a good style. And you're right. It looks like he does it like he's breathing. Yeah. But to watch him work, there's, you get to see all the decisions he's making. Yeah. And he has a book called the mad art of caricature, which I would say of all of those many, many books, his is probably the, now the definitive, for this generation, I think, the definitive book on how to draw caricatures. And I, would, I need to check that out. I absolutely will check that yeah. out. And it, Very good. Does, it, does it say how to, how to find that defining feature in someone's face to build yeah, the cartoon it around? Yeah, it, it, it sort of um, it takes you through the thought process rather than just showing you technical skills. So the thought process of observing, not just seeing something, but really observing it and then being able to recognize the things that are jumping out at you in a caricature, a great caricature, um, you know, so for instance, today's was Charlie Sheen. And um, the thing about Charlie Sheen that I would focus in on is the eyebrows, but he's sort of focused in on the shape of the jaw 
and then the hair, sort of the way the hair kind of shoots up. And of course, it, it's a it's a brilliant um, likeness of, of Charlie Sheen. You can immediately tell it. But then um, in that same Tom's Corona Couture group, you see a dozen other people's take on Charlie Sheen. Yeah. And they've all picked something different to, to exaggerate. And it still looks like Charlie Sheen. Yeah. So, yeah, he, he has um, not hard and fast like rules, but systems. Yeah. I think it's their systems to follow, which which work. They work. I've noticed and I've found new artists through that group that I've I've been checking out every day. And there are some people um, that I've never heard of who uh, are in – I think it's because it's worldwide. They're all from different countries. A lot of them are yeah. from um, – I've seen, I think, Brazil and some stuff in Europe. And these guys, mm-hmm. uh, they're so good. I've never seen them before, and now I'm following them on Facebook – and like right. you know, you know, congratulating them or commenting on their work, and I'd, I mean, I'd love it if they submitted to me in any way. It's like, God, these are mm. these are some talented because it just it opens up your pool. You know, you're like, God, I never even knew this guy, yeah. and now I'm looking at his work, and this stuff is amazing, awesome, yeah. and like, it's a way to discover new people just because all these people are now working together on this fun little thing every day. It's really it's right. fascinating. You know, it's it's interesting you say that because I, you know, you're exposed to artists now at such a huge rate because of things like Instagram and Pinterest and Tumblr and DeviantArt and Reddit and Facebook and you sort of see, you're like, wow, where the hell did you come from? It's like amazing work and you're like, why aren't you the most famous, you know, cartoonist in the world? Yeah. But, you know, because of the internet, it's it's like it's now – it's almost a great equalizer because there's a lot of merit in, you know, people just liking good work and just appreciating the work of, of a, an interesting artist that doesn't look like anyone else, you know? Um, and I've honestly, even in the last like three, four years, I've discovered artists that I've never heard of that I'm now totally obsessed with. Like I'm going through their back catalog, seeing if they have books, you know, seeing just their process, trying to figure out what tools they use, how the hell did they get that, you know? Um, it's so interesting to kind of constantly be trying new, you know, techniques and learning from other artists. I noticed that, that about you. Know the, the other day you were posting something and I didn't jump on it. Um, mm-hmm. I think cause I saw it so late, but you were posting, uh, from these ink washes, these doctor, is it Dr. Yeah. Martin's ink washes? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I didn't jump in, but I used those in college, and really? they are a okay. mess, and but they're fun, and I actually have uh, a, uh, I have a, a self-portrait I think I did in school, probably at Syracuse, maybe okay. freshman or sophomore year when you're doing a lot more foundation art, and there's it's yeah. it's like different colors of that ink, that ink stuff, and mm-hmm. I was doing like hard edges, and I was doing it's really delicate washes, but I mean that the problem with those ink wash man they're a mess and when you fuck up you're done like there's no fixing <laughs> there's no fixing that ink wash on that on that thick the paper that sucks it up like a sponge right you're done so that's what i mean i think a lot of the artists that are working in the computers today aren't familiar with how finite it used to be to work with some of these mediums where it was like you gotta start over like you're done man yeah. like you you ruined that's <laughs> But that's what I love about looking at old work from people like, you know, Hirschfeld and that, you know, it's such fine work. But if you then realize that if they made one mistake and the nib just like blew out all the ink, which sometimes Crokewell nibs can just, just, you know, whatever, yeah. or, or, or the wash goes a little bit too far, you got to start all over again. There's no undo button. Yeah. And I have an enormous amount of respect and admiration for the artists who and people were who using were like able white to have out. That amount of control. They're like white out, white out, white out. I got to white out this whole yeah. thing. I got to redo it. That's kind of like <laughs> when you saw some original Mort Druckers when he yeah. would be doing layers and stuff. Like he would cut out and then yeah. he wouldn't like. So then he'd cut out some layered paper and he'd cover it up and he'd redraw it on top of that. I love that old stuff. That's great. There's a great if you look it up. Anyone who's a really big fan of Mad Magazine and particularly of Mort Drucker, you'll love an article written by I think David Apatow. It was just a blog post, I think, um, and it was called "The Knob on the Lamp." Mort Drucker's knob on the lamp it sounds kind of anyway. What it is is basically this gigantic spread that he did for Mad Magazine of this scene of a, an, a surgery in a in an operating room. And there's this little lamp off to the side with this sort of knob on the back of it as part of this, you know, of, of all the things in the whole 
composition, this one little thing, if you zoom in on the original artwork, you can see that he's widened it out and you can see the sort of thing underneath it, but you can see he's widened it out and just perfectly redone it. No one else would have noticed that. Yeah. No one else would have given a, given a crap that that it was probably fine, but he yeah. was so like, it's almost like he, he, his work was, it had to be just right. And it, that little knob on the lamp, uh, it's worth looking up that article. Um, it's just one of those great things that little, little details that make you realize what a great artist Mort Drucker was. He wasn't just a, a fun sort of yeah. cartoonist, zany cartoonist, caricaturist. He was a real artist. And, he, and his stuff very, was very so complicated. You know, the compositions of his spreads yeah. were so intricate and yep. they were like, they were like full on movie storyboards, camera angles, yeah. like the, uh-huh. the, the direction, the, the silhouette of the action scenes and the guns and that, you know, it was like, yeah, it was like watching a movie going through his yeah. movie parodies. Um, but it was so, the energy was so goofy, but it was so real. Yeah. So, uh, and also he could get a likeness, not just from front on, but from the side, yeah. from three quarters, Constant. from this end, from amazing. That's so amazing. difficult. I can't tell you how difficult it is to get a good likeness of someone from, from this angle. You know, but he could. He did it. He just he would do it. Uh, when I graduated, uh, I I went to New York with my portfolio, and I did all the rounds with the with, with the way you used to do it, which was you had two portfolio cases, and you would drop it off at the um, you weren't allowed in the front door of the magazines. You had to go around to like where the deliveries were, and you'd have to put yeah. it into the window of this guy, and you'd sign it out, and then you'd pick it up like two days later. So you had to have two portfolios, right. otherwise you didn't have a portfolio for like two days. So you had to have two identical portfolios. So when I went to Mad and I met with Sam Viviano a couple of times, oh, yeah. he was so nice to me. And he was the best. He was the best. And he let me hang out. Um, it was the office that was on Broadway. It was after they moved from Madison mm-hmm. Avenue. And it was across the street. Office at the Ed Sullivan Theater, right? It was across the street from the Ed Sullivan Theater. And actually, because I dropped off my – I had a meeting – at Mad, and I was waiting for my meeting at Mad, and I was sitting there with my portfolio, and I was sitting on a fire hydrant outside of the Ed Sullivan Theater, and someone who worked for the Ed Sullivan, uh, for the Late Show came out to ask me if I wanted tickets to the show, and I was like, I can't. I have a meeting at Mad Magazine, but I would love tickets to the show. Another, you know, what is this? What are you doing? And I talked to her, and then through talking to her, she went to Syracuse like two years hey. earlier from me, found out what the job is that she was doing. I got that job. As my, first, as my first part-time job in New York City, I worked at Letterman wow. doing what she was doing. I was working in the audience. Did you have the department. jacket? I had Did a you ja- get the jacket? Yeah, I have a jacket. And then yes. every every Christmas, they gave us a jacket. It was a different jacket yeah. every year. I've got a bunch That's of jackets right. in my um, in my uh, closet. That's so cool. But I went to see Sam a couple of times. He was very nice to me. But I I mean, and my yeah. work was very caricature-based. It was very celebrity, silly magazine style. But, but seeing the kind of... Uh, the amount of consistency that you had to do to do like a full on parody was so much work. Mm. I was like, I can't, I I don't think I'll ever be good. I will never be good enough to do, you know, you know, that's what everyone thinks when they say more Drucker. Yeah. Yeah. You're just like too much, too much. Like I could do one picture and I'm like, that's great. And then it's like, no, no, one picture. You gotta do like 45 pictures. (laughs) One really important thing that I learned from Sam Viviano, if you, if we're speaking about him, he is one of the great, he's one of the most modest artists, by the way. He, in his own right, is a brilliant illustrator, incredibly talented and prolific in his own right. He was very... He, he would never tell you that. No, he was one of my favorites when I was growing up, and he wasn't yeah. the art director yet. He was just Sam Viviano illustrator. Yeah. Freelancing. And then yeah. he changed his name when he, when he did art. Mm. When he was Sam Viviano, the art director, but did art, he changed his name on his art, and he called himself That's right. Jack Syracuse. That's right, Jack Syracuse. Jack Syracuse. Yeah. You can almost guarantee there's a, there's an email password or something <laughs> in Sam Viviano's. Just just try Jack Syracuse. Try Jack Syracuse. It's funny because he is one of those great. Um, uh, he, you know, there was this this really tight team, tight knit team of really really funny people, and he was one of them. Um, you know, along with the sort of Nick Meglins of the world, you know, who would just be able to punch up a gag and throw it around and, and figure out tags and how to best execute something. He had a really good sense of composition. And Sam was a great art director. And, and we talked about Tom Richmond earlier. 
And uh, speaking of Mort Drucker, when Tom was submitting to MAD, he looked too much like Mort Drucker. His work just looked like he was aping Mort uh, because he absolutely admired Mort and had developed this amazing style that was almost a perfect mimic. And so they were like, listen, we love your work, but we already have Mort Drucker. Like, we don't need another Mort Drucker. And it took him a while to figure out, with some help from Sam, um, and also going away and doing some work for, like, Cracked and uh, and, and working at and other things, to, to finally come back and figure out what his unique style was. And Sam um, was the art director. Sam was Tom's art director. Um, it, oh God, 20 years ago, I guess, is when Tom started working for MAD. And, and it's one of those things that... Um, you look back on now and Sam cultivated such an interesting and talented crop of artists for man over those years. And mm-hmm. all those little magical bits of business that you see in the magazine that are so perfect. They might've come from a thumbnail sketch from Sam that you'll never know yeah. that, you know, that's just, that was, he would just do it. And it's like the silent, uh, you know, uh, like a ghost writer, you know, um, when I submitted, and he is a great, he's a great art director. I submitted, you know, portfolio stuff. And he would write me back a mm. nice note and he would mail it and he would, and he drew, nice. he drew little doodles on it. So I have like, sure. I have like original Sam Viviano little drawings. Awesome. They're like, Murray, thanks for submitting. Keep, keep at it. You know, he wasn't like, <laughs> you're terrible. It's never going to happen. But he was very <laughs> supportive. And he, and uh, I brought him whenever I went in, I think I stopped in two times. He let me in the office. This is before I even moved to New York. Um, right. I brought, I brought a box of donuts. And he was oh, like, yeah. and nice. he was like, if you bring donuts, I'll always let you in. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Sam, yeah. <laughs> and who was the other? There was another artist uh, who was the he was the the other guy was, doing the movie stuff Ryan that wasn't Flanders? was it was Torres was it Julio Torres Angelo Torres Angelo Torres it was very similar very similar style very similar but again but different slightly yeah. different and he usually yeah. did like the TV parodies where Mort would That's do the right. movies or vice versa. And yeah. um, it was much more of a – it wasn't as much of an exaggeration of a face. It mm. was almost like a portrait in a cartoon way, different yeah. than a caricature. It was just kind of like – I think Angelo was more of a traditional artist in yeah. that sense. Yeah. But he definitely got the mad spirit. You know, Angelo, yeah. prolific. Again, you know, he just churned out so much work for mad. So much stuff. And it's just like the the way that both of them were able to draw bodies and hands. Yeah. Totally. Hands and the are like the number one thing. Like learning how to if you if you saw if you see anyone do any art and the hand looks bad, you're like, nah. <laughs> well Mort was the king yeah. of hands. So Mort hands. Drucker, uh, I was very lucky. This is one of my only art stories that I'm I'm most proud of, which is and it and it has nothing to do with me at all. It was totally his generosity and the generosity of someone called Adrian Sinnott, who was the Long Island NCS chapter president. Um, he took me out when I was still living in Australia. I came out to New York on vacation and um, he took me to Mort's studio and I sat down with Mort and talked about cartooning and he showed me, he just sat down with his drawing board and started drawing hands and showing me the, how they, the, the knuckles and the connecting things and the, how they can be more expressive or just as expressive um, as the face mm-hmm. sometimes like a, a, the hands can sell a gag sometimes even better than an expression on the face you know and and sometimes he would redo it 10 11 times just to get the exact right angle but he could draw a hand from any angle and he often used his own hand as a model as if you saw his hands and you look at mad you go oh okay so they're just they're more tan yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. when i was um uh, I was going to art school throughout my, my youth. I, I had the same art teacher all through uh, elementary school, middle school, and high school. I did these uh, art classes at a place called Maryland Hall for the Creative Arts, and I had the same teacher, Mo mm. Turner. And she was a you know traditional portrait painter, pastel, but like right. in the old master type way of doing with you know the Rembrandt's triangle and all that. And mm-hmm. uh, she, she was like a portrait painter, and she was she would teach yeah. me how to do hands. And she said the hands hands are portraits in themselves. Hands are their mm-hmm. own painting. Like, don't totally. ignore the hand. The hand is just as yeah. important as the face, if not more. If you if you if you wimp out on the hand, you've just like given up on the painting. You know, because I would. Well, always, it's the hardest thing to draw. I, I would. I would say. be all it's the like, thing to draw. I'd be all in into this detail of this, and then I would yeah. do the hand. I'd just be like, you know, kind of like a nothing. Right. And she's like, no, yeah. no, no. You got to go back. You got to do these hands. Like, you can't just ignore that. And she's right. And, yeah. and if you if you kind of like let the hands wash away, 
I'm always kind of like, yeah. if you see a painting and the hands are kind of, it's like, they couldn't do it. it. It's not that they didn't want to do the, <laughs> they can't do the hands. There are people who, um, and I will sort of, I'll push back on your, uh, if you see them not being able to draw hands. There are some artists who, like Peter Cooper who could draw the best hand in the world if you ask them. But if it doesn't service the gag or if it's going to be too distracting, oh, yeah. he's just going to make it a uh, whatever hand so that your eye isn't drawn to the hand, you know? Yeah. Sometimes they on purpose, it's like a mutant with superpowers going, well, I don't need to destroy the entire building, okay? I can just, I can destroy just that little one bit so that you're not completely distracted, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's what I call on purpose bad drawing. Yes. There's on there's 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 by mistake bad drawing, which is that you just your 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 skill level is at a certain level, um, and then there's like on purpose bad, which is like you can draw really really well, but um, your I guess in order to service the story you're trying to tell, or the joke you're trying to sell, or the image that you're trying to you know um, uh, create, sometimes you have to pare down the detail yeah. on certain things. And I'm only just learning that now because I overwork everything I do. So I have to go back and do it again and again just to go, oh, I don't need that. It's way harder to do something in less lines than, you know, the luxury of being able to overdraw everything. You do a lot of – You're. it's interesting that you're – and you're still learning about doing different mediums. Like you still try out new yeah. things, which I think is great. Uh, I'm Always, so lazy yeah. that I'm just like, meh. Well – <laughs> it's interesting That's not true. it's interesting what we did when we were younger versus what I like when I was in college and I was doing illustration stuff yes. a lot more for some reason I decided maybe I saw it somewhere maybe I saw like an old illustrator doing this and I was like this is what I'm doing I, I would yeah. get masonite right I, I would have cut masonite I would cut the masonite yeah. I would do I would prime many layers of the masonite I'd sand the primer, really? I get this great this th- surface, and Texture, then I would do but... like a transparent oil with uh, <laughs> some Prismacolor for some real sharp lines, and I'd be like uh, doing real illustrated. And this this artwork would be so heavy. Yeah, of and course. then you start doing a bunch of them, and I had so I have like ten of these, right? So I have like ten piece big pieces of masonite. Like let's say my entire yeah. senior year is ten to fifteen paintings. So it's like I'm storing this stuff, and yeah. it's it's like a stack, and it's so heavy, and you can't put it anywhere. And you're just like, Jesus, why did I do this? And then as I got older and I was actually doing weekly work for newspapers, I was, yeah. I was, uh, I was doing transparent oils on sketchbook paper that I was just mm. scanning on a scanner, fixing it in Photoshop, and I would have to email yeah. it Sunday night because I had to go to print Monday yeah. morning. And I All had right. two days to do it. I didn't have time for anything to be wet or mm. anything. I didn't have time for masonite that I was sanding down. Like, I didn't have no process. It was just, like, the fastest right. and the cheapest. And that's what you end up doing. And I, I feel like because of maybe the, the, the print schedule and the publishing schedule, you, you find yeah. your way of, of, of getting things done and then being able to get them out the door as quickly as possible. And that becomes, like... Almost like the cheapest materials become the best materials. Like I started using stuff. Like I had this paper that was it was thin enough that I could, I could cut it down and I, it would it would mm-hmm. hold up the paint better. And it wasn't the expensive sketchbook paper. It wasn't like the Casson or whatever the the thick stuff. Right, it was right. like this shit paper that I would get. I could get like a a sketchbook from like Key Food, for like a kid yep. for crayons, and it would be a better surface than what I was working on from the art store. So what kind of stuff? Right. What kind of stuff do you use that isn't maybe the best stuff, but it's the stuff that's like you've hacked, <laughs> you've hacked stuff. Well, it, it's it's funny you ask that. I I remember walking into your office and seeing a sketch that you had done of Trump, like by hand yeah. and painted and everything, and I was like, oh my god! And I think I said, who did that? <laughs> I was like, I was like, you were like, well, I, I did. I was like, I'm so sorry. I know that sounded really bad. <laughs> Because I was so impressed with it, and I was like, I, I always thought that you worked digitally, but then of course you worked traditionally. I just didn't even you you, ha, you have this sort of hybrid of because you have a traditional background, and I kind of came up through newspapers where I was working traditionally in pen and ink, and then I transitioned to digital as I started doing a comic strip, and they needed it in a certain format with the certain fonts and all this sort of stuff, 
um, and it needed to be translated into different languages. So I had to pretty steep learning curve, learn how to do everything digitally on like a Wacom tablet um, when I was like in my early 20s. And then uh, which meant that I didn't really get to play around with all the different fun paints until I never went to art school. So I, I didn't try charcoals or pencils or mm. watercolor at all. No inks. That's why I posted the other day the the inks. I was like, hey, anyone use these? You know, <laughs> uh, any tips? You know, what should I not do? And, and you know, reliably every cartoonist jumped in and was like, hey, I used to use those. Um, <laughs> they stain everything it, and they last forever. Yeah, like, I think I still have right. unused bottles of that those inks. In my art, I believe it from college. I believe it. They look like CBD oil. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I'm still playing around with different nibs, dip pens, different inks, washes, watercolors, I papers. I always think. I mean, I, I personally feel like if you settle into one particular process and style, that's great. You know, you you have a style and you have a, a thing, but then you might accidentally stumble into a whole new style if you discover a new process or a new tool or a new method um the diary that i drew up speaking of like cheap tools i was uh quarantined in an empty airbnb in tulsa oklahoma uh because my wife and i got covid19 and while we were both sort of recovering i was drawing up kind of a diary of my symptoms you know just to sort of share it and help people who were wondering what you know because there was so much different information on the internet about what the symptoms are and when they come on and the onset and the timing and all that. So I was just kind of drawing it cheapest sketchbook in the world. I grabbed it on the way to the airport, you know, from a news agent, uh, you know, like a key food kind of thing uh, and just grabbed it cheap, like a, like uh, I think it was a hunt 101 Imperial nib that I had that was like crusted on. So it was, so it was pretty crusty. I hadn't been taking care of it and just one bottle of ink. And then that was it. That's what I used for that. Um, but I think the, the, uh, Nick Meglin actually, uh, taught this. It was, it's the message, not the media. Yeah. So if, if you've got a really interesting story to tell, um, I mean, you'll find a way to tell it through whatever it does. You don't have to get the most expensive Bristol board and the most expensive paints and everything. If you have an ability to tell a story using whatever tools, you'll figure it out. You'll figure out how to do it. Um, but yeah, I, I always like doing that. I, I scrap together all sorts of crap that I find around. Quite literally, find around sometimes because right now there's a lot of people moving out of Manhattan and there's stuff on the sidewalk, and I'm like, that actually mm -hmm. could be interesting. <laughs> so I'm like, good. yoink! <laughs> this this table that my laptop is on and the chair I'm sitting on were both on the sidewalk two weeks ago. <laughs> I love picking up stuff on the street. It's the best, especially in New York City, and especially if you live in like, yeah, a rich neighborhood. Like I'm in Park Slope, totally, and you know, like I'm not rich, but I'm. I'm surrounded by other blocks of very yeah. affluent type expensive buildings. They're super fancy. Right. And like those folks, uh, don't, they're so lazy that they won't drag their junk to a secondhand store. They'll just put it no, on the sidewalk. I'll throw it right? on the sidewalk. It's cheaper and quicker and so easier. So I just walk around yeah. all these nicer neighborhoods on like a nice mm -hmm. Saturday or Sunday afternoon. And I'm just like, I walk out. With nothing, and I walk home with like this. You gotta lug it home. I'm like, oh god, I you know, Marty, you did it again, and I'm always like yeah, dragging I mean, all this shit. I up. think I've I've probably furnished half of my apartment with stuff I've found on the sidewalk. Uh, you know, you clean it off and you check it doesn't have ticks or bed bugs right. and stuff, obviously. But um, what's interesting, you made that observation. We're not in a very affluent area at all. We're in quite a low uh, socioeconomic area, but. Um, we, you know, we have friends who are in these big fancy neighborhoods and when we go to see them, um, we, you know, we'll get out of the car and, uh, or arrive, you know, and see on the sidewalk, these like a mate, like a, a sofa, like a brand new sofa or, you know, a desk or a, a set of drawers that look, yeah. you know, like an armoire, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, get back in the car. We got to take this back, you know, and, and there are people. Uh, I've sort of been quietly sort of seeing if this is a subculture in New York. It is. There are people who do go to neighborhoods, uh, like sort of, you know, richer neighborhoods to do this all the time. And then That's they right. sell it on Facebook marketplace. It's a oh. big, it's a big industry. There's an Instagram account called Stooping NYC that I'm obsessed with really? and they have the best stuff and people send really? them photos uh, and locations of where these items are right now, and they put it up, and then people run and they get wow. them, and it's like beautiful desks, gigantic couches, 
TVs, sound systems, plants. It's like yeah. random stuff. And, I mean, sometimes it's really weird, and sometimes it's like a pinball machine. Like, it's like crazy shit, and, and people are yeah. always picking it up. And then if they pick it up, they show you what they did with it, and they send, like, they'll send the oh, account cool. photos, and it's called, like, a stooping success story. And then they, they, they – it's fun. I, I like to do it. It's What's it called? Stooping New York? Stooping NYC. you got to check it out. All right. That's a great recommendation. I love that. So, well, so yeah, so this is what I'm coming to discover is that I'm not alone here. <laughs> oh, no, it's fun. I mean, and it's so funny yeah. because I'm the type of person, and I think this is a type of person who immediately, mm -hmm. someone will compliment you. And the first thing I say is, oh, I got it on sale at Old Navy. What are you talking about? I got, <laughs> I got 10 of them. They were two ninety nine a piece. You know, and some people mm -hmm. will hide that fact. I brag. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I, I paid a dollar or right. I got this it's for free. Deal. Oh, I found this in the garbage. It's great. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's how people, that's how I think that, like a lot of New Yorkers are. We're like that because we love a deal. Yeah. We love finding something. Love a deal. It's like treasure hunting. We're treasure hunters. Well, um, there's dumpster diving and then there's treasure hunting. There's, yeah. there's a, there's a, I think there's maybe a Venn diagram somewhere there. But um, the other day, Sophie was out walking the dog and my wife was out walking the dog and, um, she mentioned uh, that someone had been moving out and she saw that they just left a whole bunch of art supplies on the mm. sidewalk. And I was like, shut up, where? Which, which, where? Like, oh, I literally put my shoes on, put on a mask and race down the street. Spray <laughs> I stopped what I was doing. Spray everything with Lysol. Yeah. It's becoming an unhealthy obsession. But yeah, yeah. I, totally but, yeah, I think you use any, any tools you can. I mean, I have, I got like a Cintiq here that I use for most of my work digitally and then, I have a drawing board and all my traditional paints and nibs and brushes and all that sort of stuff. I, I like to do a sort of hybrid of both. I think it's important to cultivate the working by hand yeah. um, alongside working digitally because if you rely on the undo button too much, if you know in the back of your head that you can undo any line that you draw, it's a very unhealthy habit to develop. I definitely agree. The um, The society weekend was supposed to be this past weekend it was yeah and that yeah. is the that ruben was why awards. we did the thank you search this past that's weekend, the yeah. ruben awards and that's the um what else happens at that conference. weekend? the conference yeah well uh usually we do a um drawing for kids at the hospital we we go it's this cartooning for kids program that the national cartoon society foundation organized we have a charitable uh, foundation arm uh and they they're always really fun in memphis we did a huge one for saint jude which is really really cool um and we auctioned off a lot of artwork for charity um that's always usually around the thursday uh and then friday and saturday we do like conference sessions so this year we had um we still have them lined up but they're going to do it later virtually uh jim davis you know garfield garfield um yeah gary trudeau with uh, uh you know doonesbury with ann telness um uh, we've got Patrick McDonald who does Mutz with uh, Lynn Johnston who does For Better or Worse. Um, those are the sort of more traditional uh, programming and then, you know, in comic strips and stuff like that. And then on the other end of it, we have like the stars of Instagram. So we have like Gemma Carell and Luke McGarry and um, Awkward Yeti, you know, um, Nick Selig. Um, and we have um, uh, the Awkward Cat News, which is um, – I'm not blanking on the name. Right now. I feel like Ellis. I'm Ellis, on the name. Uh, Ellis Rosen has a huge Instagram following too. He does, so rightly much. so. He has great work. So good. And then, yeah. And then what I'm finding is a lot of times people like because he's a New Yorker guy, but he has he a huge Instagram following, and it's it's almost like when you get to a point where you don't even need the magazine anymore, you you have your own following. And then yes. you can say, you know what? I'm just going to make. And then he has a cartoon he started called Junk Drawer, which are just like all I the like cartoons. It it's yeah. great. So it's all the cartoons he had pitched or maybe that didn't get anywhere. And he has, and he just mm -hmm. wants to do them for himself. So he has that up, I yeah. think, on Go Comics. And it's almost like you That's get right. there's a there's a point of inflection where if you are most if you're popular enough on your own you don't even need the magazine anymore and that's kind of like this level that people can mm. can get to on Instagram uh, which is interesting for cartooning where you're cutting yeah. out the middleman of a newspaper and you're just like you can buy my, you can buy my mugs here well I'm interested to know what you think about that I don't want to flip the interview or anything like that but I, I, I am curious because you interact with a lot of um, cartoonists that are exclusively online. 
Um, they do web comics. They're big on Instagram. They have, um, you know, great websites and blogs and, um, they're, they're artists who have cultivated a following of their own, um, of like-minded people who just like what they do. And I really, I admire art- artists who are able, are able to do that because they're not sort of, you know, curating their work to what, what's popular right now. They're just doing what they like. And then the right people are just finding them. The people who like their work are finding them. And then like Ellis, you know, they have this giant following and, you know, he certainly, when he was first getting published in the New Yorker, of course, that was a great, you know, what a, what a great way to get seen and yeah. for, to introduce him to an audience. Um, but yeah, to, after a certain critical sort of point, you do have this followership. And I'm curious to know what you think about that kind of, um, there are cartoonists who only do that, you know, who just have a big Instagram following, say, and just sell T-shirts and mugs or prints or whatever. Um, do you think that's you're seeing more of that style of of career cartooning than the old traditional method of trying to get syndicated or trying to get I mean, published in the New Yorker? Or, I feel know. like if you can figure out a way to monetize it, that is a monthly income that you can rely on. That's great. Like Patreon? I don't know. I, I don't know how people right. will make money doing it other than yeah. being able to sell stuff or having people yeah. subscribe to something where you're able to give them something per month that is something that they would want to spend five bucks a month on. That's always kind of yeah. that tough thing. Like for Weekly Humorist, I have all these cartoons yeah. and articles and fun stuff. And for the most part, I give it away for free. I have subscriptions. People will pay two ninety nine a month for a web-only subscription, and that gives you mm-hmm. unlimited access. Otherwise, you get turned off after like five articles in seven days. But it's yeah. it's like it's not a huge amount of subscribers, and it's a hustle. So for an individual yeah. who has only one type of art to offer, mm-hmm. is that going to be enough? I don't know. I mean, mm. in, unless, they're it's able, interesting. unless they're able to monetize yeah. it through Instagram and Instagram can sell ads on their space and they can make money from, I don't know, right. like sponsorships, maybe. I don't know. I mean, I'm always I, interested to hear it. That, I mean, so this is one of the panels that we, we, we will be doing uh, for the virtual Rubens that we had lined up with these Instagram cartoonists who all make money kind of differently you know they have um you know zines that they sell through their mailing list and they have merch and they have pins and they go to comic cons a lot of a lot of comic con um a lot of uh artists who go to things like mocha fest and new york new york comic con san diego comic con things that have since been canceled yeah um uh, cancelled in the actual sense um, uh, because of COVID-19. They are now sort of figuring out, oh, okay, if I can't sell prints and custom uh, commissions and pins and things, I've got to figure out another way to do it. Do I do it with a drop shipping store? You know, how do I automate that? It's a challenge. And I always love sort of hearing what different people are figuring out with things like Patreon, subscription models. I think you're right. I think a monthly reliable subscription model is probably the more practical thing to do because you can have busy months and quiet months with yeah. with sales but yeah, i mean um, but yeah you, you it's a hustle of, you have to do everything like you can't rely on one thing so you have yeah, to have yeah. you have to have a store you have to have to shopify yeah. you have to have you know mm-hmm. you can be selling postcards greeting cards t-shirts mugs mm-hmm. that kind yeah. of stuff and then also yeah. maybe original art maybe you know you're having exclusive prints maybe you're having signed exclusive yeah. minimum you know 100 amounts of this or whatever maybe you're doing custom mm-hmm. commissions custom commissions could definitely bring in money um if that they can the, they're if, also very time consuming yeah <laughs> some people are really fast like i i i would yeah. take forever on a custom commission but then other people who draw like super good like fast like you or like Tom Richmond probably can rip right, out right. something in, in a couple of seconds and they can actually do that kind of stuff fast. But it, it, it just depends on, and also it depends on how much people are spending, you know, especially in a recession, yeah. people aren't going to be parting from their money that much. So that's true. When yeah. are you doing the virtual Rubens? We're looking at August. So okay. we'll be putting out a release uh, about who's on the schedule and um, oh, how we're well, going to do it. It's, Jason, yeah. I am available. If you need anybody on a panel to be a talking hey, head, nice. I am a t- I'm, know. A, I'm a head that can talk on and on about anything. <laughs> I have a beautiful laugh. Line Clearly, here. We've, we've been talking for an hour. This is it. Barely feels like twenty uh, minutes. So much space. Um, something else <laughs> that popped into my head, and I don't know if you're aware of this. I don't know if you're a fan of watching old 
episodes of Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> I know. Angela Lansbury. I don't know if Woo. you are, but I am. But so I've watched a lot of episodes of Murder, She Wrote on rerun. I watch yeah. them. Uh, they're on Hallmark, Murders and Mysteries. They're also mm-hmm. on Amazon Prime now, if you're interested. And I didn't know that. There is an episode of Murder, She Wrote mm. that is 100% oh. about cartooning. And the murder no weapon, Lazarus. the murder weapon is a Reuben Award. A Reuben Award was it the one with Mel Lazarus in it? That's the one. Yeah, it is. And they're doing Mel Lazarus. Who did Miss Peach and yeah. Mama? Yeah, right. and they. Uh, it's about an inker, and the inker uh, kills the cartoonist, and yeah. there's blackmail, <laughs> and there's all this stuff, and it's all basically about <laughs> so newspaper cartoons. And it's about the syndicate. Yeah. It's about the. It's about. It's basically a, a parody of King Features Syndicate, and it's like, yeah. it's like really a hard nosed look at the cartooning business in like 1987. And this artist, the golden gets, years. This artist gets bludgeoned to death with his Rubin Award, and I was watching it, and I, I was like, it. "Holy shit!" <laughs> I wonder if Jason knows about this. Yeah, we showed it at the Rubens one time. I think we had a video because Mel Lazarus unfortunately passed away. Uh, uh, four, five years ago, uh, and he was a big part of the NCS. He's an ex-president of the NCS, and um, obviously was always a big part of the Rubens every year. He was my canary in the coal mine, by the way. If he was still out drinking at four in the morning at the hotel bar. I wasn't allowed to go back because he was like eighty-nine. <laughs> I was like, all right, if Mel's still out, I'll stay out. Anyway, um, that episode was like, yeah, it became, you know, lore, yeah. as it were, and and also. There's an episode. There's a there's a movie. There's some obsession with murder in this, but there's a there's a movie called How to Murder Your Wife, which is about a cartoon. It's like a comic strip cartoon. It's in this big gilded <laughs> penthouse in Manhattan. You know, just as if that's like I guess back in the day, in like fifties and sixties, the Malt Walker, Connecticut days. You know, of of you know millionaire cartoonists. That was. That was a thing, but it's so funny to watch because you're like, <laughs> he has a gold toilet. <laughs> it's just, it's amazing. It's worth looking up. It's really, I think it's like 1956 or something like that. Yeah, it's pretty funny. <laughs> well, this is wonderful. Um, I don't want to uh, take up all of your time, so I'm sure we'll we'll save some fun stories for when you're on this show again. Yes, uh, which sure. we'll have to have you yeah. on again. And I'm I'm trying to organize some more stand up stuff, so if I can figure out a Zoom right. show. I'm sure that you'll be on the Zoom show. We'll do some guaranteed deliveries on Zoom. Um, if people want to read Ginger Megs, which has mm-hmm. been going on since when did Ginger Megs start? It's like a cup. It's like a 1921. 1921. So it's coming up on its hundredth anniversary. Yeah. What do you have planned for the hundredth anniversary of Ginger Megs? Uh, some really big things. In fact, the one out of about a half a dozen big things we have lined up that I can actually mention is we got a book deal with Penguin Random House for a series of children's books. That's yeah. awesome. So that's pretty great. So I'm working on that right now. Yeah. Nice. So that's pretty exciting. Like a novelization. Yeah. Oh, cool. Very nice. Yeah. That's great. Uh, so you can see it at Go Comics or just go to gingermags.com and all the links are there. Um, but yeah, my, everything's on my website at jasonchatfield.com with Ginger Megs and most importantly, Scotch Bath Sunday. Yes, most uh, importantly. <laughs> and I've noticed that your adorable dog has been making a lot of yes. appearances in your artwork. He has, yeah. What's He's hard not to draw. Have you What's seen his I have a French bulldog puppy, yeah. Right. What's his, he's what's his name? Right now. He's sleeping and farting very loudly right now. Is, is his, what's his name again? Mortimer? Not Mortimer. His name is Morris. Morris. I knew it was an M word. Morris. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he is. Uh, he's my little studio assistant who eats everything and chews up the edges of everything that I find on the sidewalk. Very good. Well, you and Morris <laughs> have a wonderful day doing some art. It hey, was great you. talking to you. Thank you so much. You too, as always. For being on Talk with Jason Chatfield, visit him at jasonchatfield.com. Dot com. Jasonchatfield.com, everybody. Um, we will see you next time. Uh, thanks for listening to Talk Word. I'm Marty Dundix. Follow me at Marty Dundix. Follow uh, Weekly Humorous at Weekly Humorous. Sign up for our uh, weekly emails at weeklyhumorous.com. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, Jason. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening to talk word please subscribe follow us and visit weeklyhumorist.com